Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Leon Weinstein, and today we will show you part two of the five part series we call Useful Idiots. In the first part, we learned how secret documents were smuggled from Russia, why Soviets created detent, and about the program they put together to subdue Western Europe. The cornerstone of the program was to enlist Western liberals to promote Soviet ideas while thinking that they are saving the world from their own governments and their terrible intentions. The actions were to be taken in three fields. Number one, communist parties of all Western countries were to cry on every corner that either we cooperate with the Soviets or we will get a nuclear holocaust. Number two, trade unions, liberal organizations, universities, professional associations of physicians, attorneys, teachers, etc. shall be infiltrated by either communists or just, you know, by the Soviet spies in order to make them demand, detent and cooperation with the USSR and condemn their own leaders if they are not ready to do so. And number three, special focus of the Soviet spy agencies was on the Western youth. They called them untamed idiots. Students, young professionals and art entertainment world. The idea was to make them Soviet agents of influence, without them even understanding that. The program Useful Idiots, the Untamed Idiots were a part of that, uh, was approved by the Politburo and went into action. As per documents uncovered by Bukowski, first step in implementation of this program was done in 1969 when KGB created an international foundation of assistance to progressive workers' movements. Uh, translation from Russian. Uh, budget for the first year was $16 million at that time, a substantial amount. Uh, Italian comrades got 3.7 million US cash. French Communist Party got 2 million and Communists of the United States 1 million also cash. I don't know, large bills or small bills. The amount rose every year and in 1984 the comrades in the US, uh, for example, got twice as much, 2 million. <clears throat> in addition to cash, <coughs> sorry, KGB provided financial help by deals, they call it. One of the first deals was sale of oil and diesel fuel uh, at reduced prices to an Italian corporation that actually was a front of the Italian Communist Party. The happy communists sold oil for regular prices, uh, paid KGB and got cool 6 million to be used for uh, disinformation campaign on behalf of the Soviet Union. Assistance was coming in other ways as well. KGB, for example, started active infiltration of college campuses and groomed university faculty. They helped, for example, James Jackson, uh, one of the ideologists of the Marxist movement in the US at that time, to get without any effort on his part um, a PhD in philosophy from the Moscow State University. This is a document uh, in this regard uncovered by Bukowski. Similar arrangements were made regarding other followers and communist sympathizers, masters and PhD diplomas and certificates from universities in Russia, in Poland, East Germany, no, all that done in order to help them, those people, trusted people in the United States and Europe to obtain teaching positions in universities. Uh, money were also allocated to instigate and support protest movements in Europe and the US. For example, Bukowski discovered the following document in the Politburo archives. Uh, Rise, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, of course it was in Russian, now I'm trying to translate it into, into English. Rise of Negro protests. Sorry, I know that in the US you don't say this word, but that's what's written in the Russian document. In the US will bring definite difficulties to the uh, ruling class of the USA and will distract the attention of Nixon uh, administration from pursuing an active foreign policy. 
we would consider it feasible to support this movement and to assist it grows, especially the organization called Black Panthers. Now, uh, uh, in the same document, the Communist Party of the United States already infiltrated Black Panthers and is influencing their actions. Do you by any chance remember uh, from that period a photo of a young charismatic black lady with huge ball of hair on her head? Her name was Angela Davis. She purchased weapons that Black Panthers attempted um, used in their attempt to free uh, the boyfriend also from Black Panther of, of the, the of this lady of Angela Davis. Uh, he was he was in prison. Uh, they killed one of the prison workers and one guard. Uh, there were there were four casualties in in that. Uh, actually, Angela Davis after that was arrested because she obtained the weapons um, and and tried in the court. The whole progressive world, on a cue from the KGB, was demanding her release. Free Angela Davis was outcry in dozens of West European countries and actually in the U.S. as well. Free Angela Davis. I bet they didn't know that Angela was a member of the Communist Party USA and apparently a go-between between Black Panthers and the KGB. I cannot imagine uh, that she didn't know whose orders she followed. After her release she immediately flew to Moscow. Nice work, comrades. Another way of influencing uh, public opinion uh, through useful idiots was to recruit broadcasters and entertainers. As a result, those poor and not very bright souls were actively promoting communist values, carrying Soviet propaganda to the US and European masses, uh, whom they between them themselves called plebs and deplorables. Look at this document from the Politburo archives. American broadcast company ABC offered us to co-produce a series of TV shows illustrating great achievements of the Soviet Union for the past 50 years. We know, uh, we know that Soviets were on the brink of, of uh, extinction in the early 70s. People lived in poverty, agricultural workers were starving, but ABC offered Soviets to make a series of programs about their great achievements. Biggest being, of course, the forced starvation of 8 million Ukrainians who didn't want to, to, to go to form collective farms and, according to the communist thinking, deserved to die in a class struggle. However, however, maybe people at ABC just didn't know. And if they would go to the USSR to film, they would see the truth, maybe. And they would report the truth, right? Wrong. You know why? Because ABC offered Soviets to have total control over what to show what not to show, and how to show this propaganda and lies to the American audience. Please understand, an American TV broadcasting network offers KGB to create a bunch of propaganda lies and BS, sorry for my French, and gives them total control over the content. It's not mine or Bukowski wild imagination. It is written in the memo from the head of the KGB to the head of the Politburo of the USSR. Written, discussed, sealed, and wasn't supposed to be seen by anyone except the most trusted. In 1967, chief news correspondent of the Soviet media in the US, Genrich Borovik, began negotiations with several U.S. media giants about another co-production. And again, all that is the, in the Politburo totally secret documents. This time the subject was Vietnam. 
the liberal media was so happy to cooperate that all were agreeing to entrust creative and production control into the hands of the KGB. Uh, I'm saying that and, and I'm still amazed and, and shocked. The American side, according to the agreements they were discussing, had no say in what to show about Vietnam, how to show it, and had no right to stop this propaganda from being broadcasted on the American and, and world televisions. Can you imagine that American soldiers were fighting communism in, and dying in East Asia and beyond, and the major American media outlets were negotiating with the KGB about showing the KGB's version of the Vietnam War to the US audiences and pretending that this is an objective truth. All that, again, detailed in the memo from the head of the KGB to the head of the Politburo. On January 6, 1969, a Soviet news agency, APN, began negotiations with the New York Times a media giant historically filled to the rim with useful idiots and, and Soviet sympathizers. The aim was a series of articles illustrating wonderful life of the USSR population during uh, 1969 to 1970. APN, read KGB, had a right to veto any material, veto, any material in the series that they didn't like. OMG. July 30, 1970. Another program produced by KGB and ABC, this time about wonderful life of the Soviet women. May 20, 1979. Now co-production of APN and British television, Studio Granada. BBC. Raiders, Thames Television, all were agreeing to a cooperation with Soviets, having last and final word about what American, British or world audiences were permitted to see and what's not. And the audience will be told that this is an independent Western, of course, honest look at the Soviet Union and life there. What we would be getting is a pure lie aimed at promoting the best and most human system in the world, called socialism. Thank you, dear idiots. Useful, untamed, all. Interesting to know. What those who lied to their countrymen, their friends, family members, their children and grandchildren, what they thought. Why did they do what they did? The Selling America for Personal Gain agenda didn't start, of course, here and now. You would be surprised to learn what progressives did practically immediately after World War II. Henry Wallace, Vice President and Secretary of Commerce, uh, became the first public figure to oppose Harry Truman's Get Tough policy with the Soviets. When uh, that he adopted um, after it became clear that the Soviets were seeking to expand their empire to confront, uh, to control Eastern Europe and confront the Western part of the world. In October of 1945, while he was still Secretary of Commerce, Wallace secretly met in Washington, D.C. with Anatoly Gorsky, the station chief of the NKVD. This is the forerunner of uh, the KGB. KGB files show that Wallace told Gorsky that he wanted to share the secrets of an, the A-bomb with the Soviets and complained that Truman was being influenced by an anti-Soviet group that wanted Anglo-Saxon uh, bloc to have dominance in the world. Uh, and, and he hoped that the Soviet Union would help 
what what you would think he, he would he would want them to help you know it's actually it's simple to help Wallace's ambition to become the US president and in 1948 Wallace attempted to run for the president of the United States on the progressive party platform and he as we know thank you God lost for a member of the president's cabinet asking the Soviets to intervene to help his side with an internal battle within the administration was, was more than indiscreet. It was the action of, of a willing tool of Moscow. You remember we, word willing, we stressed earlier. Eventually Truman fired him in September of 1946. Let's stop here. Next chapter will be even more explosive than this one. Hard to imagine, right? Until that time.